Greetings from the Jazz Cloud, I'm Richie Zellan, and I want to welcome you to part two of Facts and Fallacies of Jazz Improvisation here on the Jazz Guitar Channel. Today, I'd like to talk about some jazz theory fallacies and half-truths that may be hindering your progress as a jazz improviser. And this is going to be a controversial lesson for some, so if you're a believer in some of these concepts, which I will call fallacies, try to keep an open mind and be sure to hear me out before you write me off. Let's dive in. Fallacy. Never play an avoid note or chromatic approach on a downbeat. This is a widely misinterpreted concept. All the great bebop musicians I have transcribed play chromatic or non-diatonic approaches on the downbeat. And let's look at a couple of examples by one of the leading architects of the bebop idiom, Charlie Parker. So let's take a couple of examples from Charlie Parker's composition, Anthropology. The very first measure goes like this. And here we have downbeat, downbeat, and that's an avoid note, that's the four. And immediately after that on the upbeat, he doesn't resolve it right away. He goes from the four to a chromatic, which only resolves on the downbeat of four to the three. Now, in the same tune, if we go to the third measure, we have three, four, one, which is downbeat, downbeat on, uh, on two, and that's a four again. And there's so many more examples. I could go on forever and not just Charlie Parker. So how did this fallacy come into being? Well, it's really a half truth like many of the fallacies I'm pointing out in this series. You know, everything is relative in jazz. And in the case of avoiding chromatic approaches on the downbeat, what people forget to mention is that this so-called rule is subject to tempo. If you are playing at a real slow tempo, those chromatics on the downbeat are going to take twice as long to resolve to a chord tone, and consequently, you are going to hear a dissonant clash with the chord of the moment. The same problem occurs if you play chromatics that last a quarter note on the downbeats of not only a slow tempo, but even a medium tempo. On the other hand, when you play at a real fast tempo, the resolution of the chromatics happens so fast that playing them even as quarter notes on downbeats ceases to be a problem. Again, everything is relative. So in light of these facts, I would propose correcting this fallacy with the following statement. Fact. You can play chromatic approaches on downbeats as long as they don't last more than an eighth note. And I believe this is a good safety rule, at least for most tempos. Just remember to use your ear because again, it's all relative. If you want to know more about this and hear me demonstrate more examples, a number of years ago, I did a video exclusively devoted to this subject. It's called the no avoid note on downbeat. And I will place a direct link in the info section down below for those interested. Here's another big misconception, fallacy. To improvise, you just need to know your scales and the names of the notes they are made up of. Another half-truth. Yes, we need to learn the scales and know the notes that are included, but this is not conducive to the mindset required for jazz improvisation. First of all, when we improvise, we have no time to think of note names. I have mentored many players who have a strong background in classical guitar. 
one of the biggest challenges I have with them is to get them to stop trying to think in note names when improvising. That's a skill required more for sight reading. There is no time for this when we improvise, so instead we have to think of, the, of each scale as a numerical pattern. And by numerical, I mean it's intervallic makeup, which will not change for the same scale, regardless of what key we use it in, but also because when we improvise, we should be hearing the makeup of our lines in terms of intervals relative to the root of the current chord scale. Again, these are fixed numerical patterns that we only have to learn once for each scale family. Let me demonstrate. So let's take anthropology again. And let's say I'm playing it in the original B flat. And the notes are B flat, uh, D, C, B flat, E flat, C, D, F, that's a lot of thinking. Now I could easily go root three, two, one, four, two, three, five. And let's say that I want to play it in a different key. And this could be any idea that we're playing during a solo. And if we're thinking in terms of actual notes, we're in trouble. So let's say, I take this initial uh, riff from anthropology to the key of G. Now I have to think G, B, A, G, C, A, B, D. Isn't it much easier to just go one, three, two, one, four, two, three, five, and it's the same thing in numerically speaking in intervals than what I played in B flat. See, if I'm thinking in terms of intervals, my hear identify the intervals um, relative to the root of, of, of the scale. I could do that anywhere. And, and not just because I'm using the same fingering, but in any fingering. So that's the importance of thinking numerically and not in actual notes. So to correct this fallacy, I propose the following statement. Fact. To improvise, you need to know your scales and its intervallic composition. Another related misconception is the following. Fallacy. When improvising, just play the mother scale of the current key over the entire progression. This mindset is prevalent with players who get into jazz coming from a rock or even blues background. So in the case of guitarists, the great majority. <laughs> It's the result of years of, of, of probably playing a single pentatonic over all the chords in a progression. But the approach is totally different and a lot more sophisticated when you're dealing with a jazz progression. Fact, jazz musicians improvise over the changes unless they are playing modal jazz. And what this means is that when the chord changes, you improvise based on its corresponding scale. On the other hand, when playing a modal tune or progression, it is customary to play the single mode that generates all the related diatonic chords. If you want to know more about this, I recommend that you watch two lessons I did on modal progressions. One is called Dorian progressions and the other one Phrygian cadences and I will place a direct link in the info section down below as usual. Back to the subject of improvising over the changes. Here's another related detail that you need to be aware of. Fact. Bebop musicians don't think so much in scales, but instead in terms of arpeggios. 
So let me give you an example of a horizontal line. And this is just a pure scale. Now, at first hearing, it just sounds like the B flat major scale. But this could be backed up by a series of different chord progressions. You really can't hear what harmony it implies other than hearing a basic major scale. So this could be It could also be in a minor key. So this is good for modal progressions where you're playing just a single scale that fits over several related diatonic chords to that modality. But when we play bebop, we're playing over a bunch of different changes and we want to imply the changes in our lines. So we think vertically, which is thinking of the arpeggio in terms of targeting the important notes. So listen to this, this line. You can clearly hear a two, five, one. So here we're targeting the uh, chord tones in the arpeggio with the non-chord tones. If you want more info, a while back I did a lesson called Stop Thinking in Scales. As a matter of fact, it is part of a 10-part series called Improve Your Jazz Solos. And I think you will really enjoy it. And I will place a direct link also in the info section down below. So there's several there that will complement this series. I'd like to conclude with two misconceptions, especially among newer jazz improvisers. Fallacy. It is easier to improvise over a ballad than over an up-tempo standard. I used to think so too when I started out, but everything is relative, like I said earlier. At a slow tempo, every single note we play is put under a magnifying glass and you really have to be a mature improviser to fill the larger duration of each measure with lines that don't put your listener to sleep. <laughs> this is storytelling time and you better have something to say. When we had end of semester evaluations with students at the music schools I've taught at, usually a student would play a medium to up-tempo bebop piece where he would play through the changes mostly in eighth notes to try to impress the faculty with his chops. When it came time for him to improvise over a ballad, we all smiled at each other and said, now comes the true test. Let's see what he can do with a ballad. And usually this was their weak point. The cliches and, and flurry of constant eighth note lines just didn't work there. So this is where you notice not just their technical proficiency on the instrument, but the true level of the player in developing a flowing melody with a sense of direction and meaning. And that's why I choose to have my students initially improvise over tunes at slow tempos, even if they have the dexterity to play fast. This is where you clearly hear all the melodic flaws, the bad note resolutions, weak chord transitions, and you can actually correct them. Once you can play and sound good at a slow tempo, it's just a matter of time before you sound great at any tempo. And this leads me to another related half-truth. Fallacy. The less chords, the easier it is to improvise over. Maybe when it comes to soloing over traditional 12-bar blues using a single pentatonic, but usually jazz tunes with few chords stretching over several measures happen to be modal tunes you know, like, so what, or impressions. Have you ever thought of the fact 
that both Miles and Train began to explore modal tonalities in the latter part of their careers after they had spent decades soloing over the changes? Well, like playing a ballad, you need to have a lot to say in order to fill the amount of space taken up by a single chord. In other words, if you don't have the language down, you are going to run out of licks real fast. Train felt he had exhausted how much he could say playing over the changes. So for him, a modal tune with a couple of chords was like a fairly empty canvas where he was set free of the harmonic restrictions imposed by too many chords. He was now free to experiment. And in doing so, he was able to explore what we call playing outside the changes. And it consisted of superimposing entire new progressions over the duration of a single chord when he improvised. But this was only possible thanks to the experience he gathered having spent decades playing over regular changes. And there are other fallacies out there that I could mention, but I'm going to conclude here. Before I sign off, for those of you who have stuck with me this far, <laughs> and I thank you, if you are interested in the study of jazz improvisation, I have developed an online course guaranteed to take your playing to a whole new level. It's called the uh, Bebop Guitar Improv Series, which consists of six books and hundreds of step-by-step -step video tutorials featuring the proven resources you'll need to learn, practice, and master the art of jazz improvisation on guitar. For more info, please visit bebopguitar.richiezellon.com and you will find, as usual, a direct link in the info section down below. And I thank you for your comments and likes and welcome your questions. And if this is your first time on the Jazz Guitar Channel and you enjoyed this lesson, please be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell icon so you won't miss any of my upcoming lessons. Until I see you again, stay safe and may peace be with you. Shalom.